sorry. Hello, Hello everybody. Welcome to this edition uh, of the Founder Institute uh, podcast. Uh, my name is Mike Supervici. I lead the alumni success group here at the Founder Institute. And this is Dustin. Hey, I'm Dustin Betts. I'm head of community and content at the Founder Institute. And uh, today we have a very, very special guest. Uh, and I'm gonna let Brian uh, introduce himself to, to, to the world here, but we're really, really thankful because this is a great topic. Uh, and we're going to dive into some really important feature, uh, uh, really important uh, things, and also yeah. some really important, uh, uh, very timely topics. Uh, so, Brian, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, uh, sure. My name is Brian Janesco, and I am a serial entrepreneur. I launched my first business about 15 years ago uh, as a pioneer in what is now the fresh meal delivery business. Uh, it's a multi-billion-dollar business, but back then we were the first. And uh, ultimately, after uh, doing enough things right, we were able to scale the business, raise a little bit of venture capital, and then ultimately we sold the business. Uh, it started in 2008, but we actually sold it in 2009 to Nutrisystem, the weight loss company. Um, so definitely a very timely topic for, for today's discussion on uh, what might be uh, going into a winter season for us right now. But, from that experience, I learned a number of things that are a little applied to uh, many of the areas I've been involved in the last several years, notably how to build a company uh, that creates value, that gives back to the community, um, the value of helping entrepreneurs get going. And, and those have really been core to me as um, not just as a, as a seasoned exited entrepreneur, but also in terms of what we can do to help create the next generation of, of scalable uh, businesses that have impact and meaning. Or as I think Founder Institute says, building businesses that are both meaningful and enduring. I, I love that uh, particular statement. Um, and I am a former director of a Founder Institute here in New York. Gabe Zickerman and I uh, launched and, and ran that for a few years. Um, gosh, that was a few years ago at this point, but you know, it was so exciting to be able to be a part of the Founder Institute and understand um, what they were doing to help early stage businesses really get going. And what I love about the model is it's it's very unique uh, in, in many regards, certainly compared to other accelerators. And I think you're uniquely positioned to really help these dreamers, these emerging entrepreneurs really get going. And um, I'll kind of tie up to where I am today. I'm working uh, with Michael Loeb, uh, who had co-founded Priceline and built a number of other uh, multi-billion dollar opportunities. And he's backing uh, some of the ventures that I'm, I'm working on today, uh, including Grow Academy. So I'm very fortunate to be in an area surrounded uh, all day, every day, by successful entrepreneurs, business builders, and um, working with people like you who are really trying to uh, help incubate the next generation of scalable startups. So How's if I, that? So if I recall, <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Thank you so much for uh, uh, providing all this knowledge for our community. This is really, really helpful. You know, uh, you know, back back to New Kitchen uh, a little bit. You know, that that was a that sounds like it was a pretty tough time for you to be building this business. And not only is it just you know the the, the business itself, but also just doing this in 07, 08. It was, those are some pretty rough times. Yeah, and it's interesting because so much uh, so much has happened since the last recession, and I've been very fortunate to be involved with a couple of other successful uh, mentors. Uh, so I really haven't given it much thought. But as with anything, the economy is cyclical, and uh, we are in the longest bull run market in U.S. history. And winter is upon us. Uh, if we think of it uh, in, in the spirit of uh, seasonality, um, you know. I think the coronavirus, I think what Apple cutting their profit forecast, Microsoft announced uh, recently that they're cutting their forecast, showing another comp not, number of companies that are cutting their forecast because they're not able to produce production. A lot of companies rely on China, a lot of production needs. So that's going to make it to the economy. So uh, I do believe that we are entering uh, probably a, re a recession area, at least a market downturn for sure. How deep it is, I, I can't predict that. And then frankly, I don't know how uh, much of an impact coronavirus ultimately will have right. uh, on, our, on our society uh, from a health and, and human standpoint. But from a business standpoint, we're already seeing a slowdown uh, and it was just accelerated or aggravated by uh, the coronavirus. I didn't really answer the question. You were asking about starting a, a, the business in 2008 or nine. Uh, should, I, should I jump into that a little bit more or what would you? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think every economic downturn is obviously yeah. a little bit different. They tend to be triggered by different things. I think two months ago, you yeah. know, we wouldn't be talking about the coronavirus being the trigger for, you know, what might or is very likely to be the next economic downturn. But maybe tell us a little bit about your experiences um, 
through the recession period in particular uh, at New Kitchen, right? Like what kind of yeah. changed in the business versus stayed the same? Um, yeah, and how much of that was, do you think was a result of recession versus, you know, things that were just happening naturally as the business changed and grew during that period? Well, I think, I think you always need to be mindful of, of economic conditions, but at, at, at the core, I think for all of us as entrepreneurs, we're trying to solve a problem. And um, if you're very focused on solving that problem and you uh, think you've got a great solution and you've actually got customers who are engaging with your product or service uh, and or opening up their wallet, which is demonstrated uh, proof of, of, of that relationship, I think you're onto something. And in the case of New Kitchen being a fresh prepared meal delivery service, Look, people were time starved and cooking and preparing meals is, 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 is a challenge. And one might think during recession, well, that's going to change. Um, and, 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 and certainly it may, depending on the type of service that you're offering. So for us, when I look at uh, as, as a recession hit in 2007 and 8, there were really three things that I thought as I was preparing for today to, to really think through. There are three elements that I believe are critical for any business, especially if you're positioning yourself as a premium product. Uh, number one is, are, are you providing um, an outcome? Uh, what are you actually selling to your customer? You're not actually selling them a product. It's an outcome. That's number one. Number two, it's uh, really understanding who your consumer is and really understanding uh, the behavioral, the psychographic uh, data elements about that consumer. Uh, and that will help you think about how you target that person, uh, retain and acquire new customers, even during a downturn. And then number three, how do you create value? It's really creating more value, giving the customer more, more value than they're paying for. So we look at those three elements. I think we did those, those things pretty well. Um, and let's start with number one. Uh, when I think about um, providing um, an outcome, I wasn't selling you food because you're, you, know, you had a long day at work, you're coming back, you just didn't want to cook that night. That, it, that, that wasn't at all. What, what it really was, it, it, over the course of a month, if you ate healthy, delicious, organic meals that were fresh prepared, delivered to your door, not only are you going to have more energy, you're going to feel better, but you can lose weight, be in the best shape of your lives. It's often during these down times when we're selling this outcome that over a 30 or 60 day period, you can be the best you can be because we all have to step up our game, especially when we think we're at risk, or our lives are at risk. We want to be the strongest players we can. And we didn't do that. And I think for the investment that I took, we did, uh, buying New Kitchen as an investment in your health and your wellness. People came to sort of rediscover themselves, uh, to transform themselves, and they stayed for the convenience. Uh, so while people may have you know, eaten our meals 24, you know, seven days a week for four to eight weeks, after that period, they were continuing to, to, to enjoy meals you know, at a more ad hoc basis, but we were ex able to extend the revenue life cycle of that particular customer. So that's number one. Um, number two, really understanding who that consumer is, because there are certain consumer segments, if you don't have a strong connection with, you don't have a strong bond with, they're gonna leave. And so we understood that our primary consumer was a person in their mid thirties that was a time star professional. They were working parents, they need solution. And so really understanding and leaning into that helped us address those needs a little bit better, which then led to point number three, creating more value without having to cut prices. Sometimes there's inevitably a little bit of discounting that goes on. However, we can't discount our way to the bottom. You've got, you've got to pay salaries, you've got to pay overhead, you've got to pay for the product itself. So what other ways can we create value that would lock in the customer? So obviously by knowing who your customer is and understanding what's important to them, discounting may not be the most relevant thing to them. Offering them some other solution, uh, additional meals, uh, other, other, in the case of New Kitchen, uh, we had a lot of uh, complimentary services. We worked uh, with different uh, healthcare facilities, gyms, uh, fitness facilities, and, and other places where you could go to to create a, a better life, whether it was you know, Equinox, as an example. Uh, you could get a complimentary membership for a month. Equinox is happy, we were happy, the customer was happy. Those are things as, uh, as we try to find partnerships for complimentary brands. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's really interesting. I kind of want to riff on that a little bit because there's, yeah. a lot, there's a lot of tidbits in there. So, you know, yeah. definitely provide uh, a solution to a problem that is a real problem. It seems like a very big yeah. thing here. You know, um, how, how did you go about, you know, managing through this, this time with, with, you know, with like your employees and everybody that's involved in the business, right? Obviously, like you mentioned this part about like the bottom line and making sure that your unit, that you're profitable in a unit or unit economics look really good and yeah. things like that. And 
you know, how did you manage through all that uh, during that time? And what are some of the best practices there that you can share with all of us? Well, I, I, I think we, we really didn't do, uh, we did some discounting, but it was really reconfiguring that and how we sold it. So obviously there may have been some, maybe we would have done more sales beforehand. I, I'm not sure. We don't have another uh, data point, but right. we didn't fundamentally shift anything that we were doing other than the fact that we weren't spending a lot of money on, on offices, lavish offices, doing ex expensive um, activities that I find a lot of startups that get funded, they tend to overspend or they try to ramp up very quickly. We were very deliberate with how we grew and scaled the business and we work with a lot of outsourced partners. So I think that's probably onto something really important there is, is having a lean team and then making sure you work with outsourced uh, relationships, whether it's on the marketing side, product development side, um, you know, in terms of our, our, our co-manufacturer who helped us produce the products. Um, you know, we put in orders every day, we had certain minimums, and as long as we hit those thresholds, we were able to manage that pretty well. And any capital investments that were required, were, those costs were borne by uh, the partner that we had. Um, so that's how we really manage that. I do think employees tend to be a little bit more uh, committed to you at that point, uh, because you're doing well, you tend to see not as much job hopping. So for us, it actually was a great opportunity to uh, attract some, some, some better quality folks. But we didn't do a whole lot of hiring during that period. We did a lot of working with outsourced partners and, and we continued, we leaned into that. Obviously it provided more flexibility and um, it worked to our advantage, I thought. Awesome, did you, did you create any sort of like plan or some sort of planning uh, beforehand? Obviously it's really hard to plan against like a Black Swan event or whatever, but like at least have some kind of like measures in place that you can share with us, if, if at all. I, well, I, I don't think there's anything overt, but the idea of creating value, uh, sort of that last point, always be in a place to create value. That, that's been a fundamental uh, philosophy. Um, something I've always subscribed to. So I wanna make sure that I'm adding value to uh, those I serve. And um, that's at the core of everything that we do. And I believe that is what will differentiate products uh, because you're always trying to go above and beyond and make sure the customer has an incredible experience. Um, I can't say we hit it out of the park every time, but at, at, at the same time, I can say that uh, it served us well and it's serving me well today. So I think, um, you know, what, what shifted between then and now, I believe, are models that are really focused on mission, social impact. So if you've got a product or service that's really aligned, uh, truly and authentically aligned uh, to, to the product or service you're selling, I believe that you stand a much better chance during a recession as well. Uh, and what I mean by that, and the difference is in the past, we always supported causes for hunger. When we first launched New Kitchen, we were working with uh, WEDCO, the Women's Housing and Economic Development Council in New York to help uh, at-risk moms, young moms, who didn't really have a place to, 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 to live, and this particular building gave them shelter, and they rented out a kitchen space. That's where we started the business. And we got to know firsthand some of the people who were struggling with not just hunger, but with how to eat healthy. And so uh, it, was, it was such an incredible eye-opening experience. And so we were able to partner at an early level. Now, we didn't focused on that. We didn't make that part of the brand DNA. We didn't promote that. But what I'm finding today is if that is part of your brand DNA, make that front and center. Uh, it doesn't have to be serving you know, the homeless or feeding the hungry. I think whatever is important to you, whatever that core value to your business is, make that front and center so that the consumer who identifies with you can also identify with that. Because as, as you may know, millennials want to make sure that their dollar has impact. They want to make sure that they're buying products and services that align with their core values. Yeah, we agree 100%. And as a matter of fact, uh, our, you know, as a side note here, we, we yeah. also... Uh, want to uh, agree with that. So we want to have 80% of our businesses over the next 10 years be impact, uh, have some sort of an impact focus. And that's a big core to our DNA as well. Um, you know, I want to double click on that a little bit, though, you know, yeah. why do you think that that in let's say in a recession, uh, you know, these companies tend to have a, a possibility to be more robust? Do you think it's, it's more from a marketing perspective, and people just are going to want to continue to, to, to vote with their dollars because of that? Or uh, is there something else? Is it easier for them to recruit employees because maybe there's the mission aligns? Or how, how do you think about that? 
Well, that's a great question. And I think it could be a little bit of all, all of that. But, you know, during recession, people are going to cut back. So uh, right. it's typically subscriptions, uh, things that are viewed as nice to haves. And, and, you know, meal delivery clearly could fall into that category. Um, so I can see a lot of people not getting that you know, meal kits delivered once a week where you spend an hour preparing a meal with your loved one, if that's what you do. I, again, if you're positioning it as that, I think those items tend to be cut. It's a matter of how you position it. And I think you can think about, um, you know, how you market it and the value that you provide and really the outcome. So I'm going to come back to what we did. I mean, we provide fully prepared meals. And like I said, if you ate with us for a month, you're going to feel better. Uh, you're going to look better. Um, it's a pretty strong value proposition. And um, even during a downturn, uh, people want to make sure they're at their best. And if you can guarantee that uh, and, and provide 100% satisfaction guarantee, you're in a much stronger place. So I think from the consumer perspective, that's how I would address that. From an employee perspective, I think you can attract and retain talent much. And even today's consumer who uh, or employee who could be considered, uh, businesses might say that they're a little more fickle since job hopping is so common. Uh, I, I think people should always be looking for opportunities that can help them be the best. But at the same time, a recession really makes you think about, should I dig in here a little bit more? What, what, what value can I continue to add here? So I actually think it's better for companies during recessions with the employees they have in terms of re attracting and retaining talent. Um, you know, oftentimes marketing might become a little cheaper since budgets sometimes are freed up. And, um, you know, some other companies are pulling back on marketing companies that are struggling. And so you're not going to push the demand up for pricing, whether it's on Facebook or other digital channels or offline channels as well. You know, um, that I, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. It just it triggered some other questions. Sorry, I know Dustin's got a bunch of questions for you too, but for the entrepreneurs that, uh, have never been through this type of an event before, or. Uh, are you know maybe have never even lived through it as an employer or whatever yeah, you know, what yeah. generally happens in, in in a recession you know um, fear 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 people get scared um it's natural and and i definitely had an element of that when i sold the business um uh i really really well how much longer is this going to go on I, you know so i kind of you know, that, that weighed in a little bit. And I was actually not looking to sell it. I was looking to find a strategic partner. So the fear that drove me to say, I need to find something bigger than myself so we can plug into their network for additional distributions. I was really looking not to extend the brand life value that led us to Nutrisystem at that time. Um, but I, 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 in full candor, I will admit that there is a fear factor. And I think that's the biggest thing that happens during recession. Uh, frankly, it's an opportunity for all of us to deep breath, step back and recognize that there is opportunity. Whenever there's a chaos, whenever there's a downturn, um, I don't know the, the exact depth, but most of the Fortune 500 companies today were formed during a financial crisis, during a downturn. Um, you know, whether it was FedEx, mo mo G, most companies were, were formed during uh, rough times. And so um, if that is anything to take note in, because if you can do well during these times or at least get going, as the economy improves, hopefully you will improve with it. So from a, so from a fear perspective in 07, 08, what are some of the things that happened? Like what are some of the things that, the, 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 where you went through that, right? So obviously yeah. I think capital probably was a little lower, but tell, tell us a few examples of some of the things well, that fear drove. I think capital definitely dries up. People, the purse strings tighten. So that is a real manifestation. So um, it's it's challenging. So even if you have a great business and you're looking to get funding, there are a lot of people who may love you and what you're doing is great, but they're nervous. And so a lot of people pull back on the funding. Uh, venture capital dried up in 2000 during that, that crash. And then clearly again in 2008 and nine, um, you know, started in 2007. Uh, there was, it was, it was tough. And even, uh, if you're trying to get a mortgage for a house, I mean, there was no, it was very difficult to, to, to get money. So, uh, and I, again, I'll go back to fear. Fear is what drives that. But if you understand that, how can you work within that? Uh, again, I'm not saying it's easy, but if you understand that psychology, and if you even haven't been through that before, listen to people who have been through that and who were able to manage and navigate some of those moments more successfully. And I think you can try to at least um, counterbalance some of that. So um, in terms of raising capital, uh, you know, for us it was finding a strategic partnership as opposed to asking for money. 
But what Nutrisystem needed was a way to differentiate itself. So try to think big and broad with whatever business product or service that you're offering. Think about who, what other big company, what other organization might benefit from partnering with you or being associated with you. Uh, and, and, and sometimes we get stuck, we're small, we're not big, there's a whole host of things that may go through your head. Forget about all that and think about who would be that ideal sort of distribution partner that you can help them, it could help you. And by doing that, during these, some of these harder moments, there might be some incredible that you'll be able to build, whether it's a direct infusion or it's actual partnership that can drive more sales that indirectly sells obviously more cash for the business. Is that helpful? Uh, <laughs> yeah, super, super helpful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really like kind of what you said, um, or I find it very interesting that, you know, a, a large amount of businesses are actually founded during economic downturns that, yeah. you know, yeah. I think like you, you never know what the next cause of the economic downturn is going to be. But then when you look back in retrospect, sort of like, it's the causes kind of eventually, they always seem obvious in retrospect, or, you know, <laughs> the opportunities that emerge kind of seem obvious maybe so now we're going to have you play kind of maybe armchair uh you know spe yeah. speculate a little bit you know what kinds of products or services do you think tends to be more successful or maybe tends to fail more often during a downturn uh and then maybe if you want to extrapolate that out and, and bring yeah. out the ball you know what do you think possibly given kind of the macroeconomic conditions that we have right now in 2020 you yeah. know, opportunities that you see um, possibly um, to be disrupted next in, in the next downturn? Well, I think education needs to be disrupted in a big way. So number one, uh, the cost of education, higher education is is, is out of hand. And that's one area that not, for whatever reason it's not been touched. So uh, I'd love to see that distributed in a big way. Um, but in terms of products that people will start to cut, I may have touched on this a few moments ago, but subscriptions, if you look at, um, you know, you've been on TV. Do you need? I don't know. I, I price subscribe to plenty of things, and, and I even now I question: Do I really need all of these? Because I end up going back to Netflix and Amazon, Hulu for for everything else. So, those are things people will look at. They'll look at um, some of the other models that aren't essentials in their life. So, if you are a product that fault, that's certainly if you're premium priced, uh, you're you're, you're going to be in a position. But things that people know and love, things that are important for that outcome, uh, you've got a, some kind of you know a beauty regimen, something that you, you know, spin cream. You may try to look for a less expensive version, but if you have something that works and you like. That's providing an outcome. It's making you feel better. It's making you look better. Maybe it's anti-aging, whatever the case. Um, those are things that people will continue to buy. Maybe they're not going to see an uptick in that. So as a company, you've got to figure out what other products and services can you sell to that consumer who's already loyal to you. So while customer new customer acquisition may be difficult during recession, extending the lifetime value of customers through you know, additional products and services is a great way to experiment and to grow. Um, yeah, so I think on, I, I, I don't know if, if you want me to, I can continue to riff on, on, on this, but uh, those are, 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 are things that I think are, are important. Um, and you brought up something earlier about the type of recession. Usually a recession is precipitated by a credit crunch of some sort. Um, you know, in the case of 2000, it was really a bit of a, a, a lot of free, you know, cheap capital, low cost capital. There was a lot of venture money in the world and it went into a lot of tech startups. And as soon as you hear the proverbial taxi driver talking about buying you know, into an IPO behind the tech startup, uh, that's time to be scared. That's when you should be selling. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. And we had a crash that was really precipitated, that was precipitated by the you know, easy, easy credit, easy capital. And a lot of it was flowing into products that were, you know, uh, not necessarily proven. It was based on eyeballs. There was no sense of, of profitability. It was all eyeballs. Um, and, and actually, the, the, the crash of 2007 and eight was really a credit crunch. It was a housing crisis. That was a different kind of bubble, uh, that crash. I think the one that we're ex going to experience now is probably related more to 2000. So if I had to compare the two, it'd be something more like that. Cash is incredibly cheap today. You've got a lot of funds, a lot of venture groups, a lot of family offices with a lot of excess cash that are just plowing money. And you're starting to see that fall apart with, with, uh, with WeWork, uh, with Uber. Uh, a lot of these companies. So it's already happening. I believe we're already at, in the, in, at the start of a recession. Um, and so when you look at what's already happening, uh, you know, it's just going to get a lot worse and funding will dry up for those kind of businesses. I think business models is in 2020. You need to think through what is your path to profitability? What are you doing to try to drive that? Let's just drive market share. Um, 
there may be exceptions, but I can tell you everything I'm hearing, and I didn't know the mention for right now, everything about what it is the past profitability. Yeah, and, yeah, and we, we agree as well. I think that having profitable unit economics is just absolutely important these days. Um, it's yeah. really difficult to scale. Yeah. And, and the, from, for founders and alumni, being that most of you are yeah. not in Silicon Valley, the, the access to the level of capital that you would need to try to build kind of an eyeballs business uh, is just tough anyway. Like even if yeah. you were in the best of times, but your company is headquartered, I don't know, in, in, uh, in, in Africa or something, like you're just not, yeah. you're not gonna have that capital anyway. So either way, you have to figure out a way to basically yeah. profit from the, uh, the first, time and the, the more direct you are to that capital the better right so if your business model is like hey i have this thing pay me for it that's very direct if your business yeah. model is like oh uh i have to get these people over here and i'm going to sell them to this other third party thing that is you know a, a double loop or whatever you want to call it like for example like the the, the people that sell like analytics uh, uh you know type of yeah. or data businesses that's much more difficult to make. So try to provide a product that is so valuable that people want to pay for it, pay for it, you know, uh, solve a real hair on fire kind of a problem that people want to, that they need to spend money on. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And we're talking a lot about consumer products, which um, we know the middle class drives a lot of the consumption, the bulk of the economy, but we can't forget about, you know, B2B enterprise, uh, biotech, there's other solutions. Certain sectors obviously right up and it's just really hard. But when you look at some of the business to business, if you're in a mode of figuring out how we can create more value or what we're actually doing and convince uh, the person writing the check on the side that you've got something and you're able to execute it in a streamlined way with that path toward profitability and solid business model economics, you're, you're obviously in a much stronger, stronger place. And, um, uh, I firmly believe that. I, I've been trying to uh, promote that uh, within the walls here at Loeb where I am, and we've got about 40 early stage businesses here and thinking what's your path profitability and how are you gonna get there? What are you doing today that's gonna get you a little bit closer and are you hitting some of those metrics? Yeah, no, B2B, I mean, speaking back, bringing it back to fear, right? The B2B buyer, yeah. you know, the part of their fear is, am I gonna get fired, right, if I make this decision? <laughs> um, and so yeah. you really need to provide a lot of value. Uh, yeah. and to, the, to the buyer and to everybody involved. So you you, know, you got to think about that uh, when you're building your product uh, and your your go to market and all that. And uh, it's super critical to do that now uh, before you know you find yourself down the line after you spent all this uh, all this money to yeah. raise or whatever building this yeah. product that's not really quite uh, quite where it needs to be. So um, just food for thought. Yeah, and I think one thing that's also interesting too, just to bring it back to kind of the social or impact startups is like, I, you know, I think we believe that some of the next trillion dollar businesses are going to be these kind of impact companies that are solving really, really big problems. And that also, the thing underlying that comes back to, yeah, value and outcomes, right? Um, and, and similarly, I think that, you know, the big opportunities that are gonna present themselves are gonna be to solve some of these huge problems. So. I, I agree. I'll bring up a, a company that I was just with before uh, speaking to you here, uh, Bombas. I was with the co-founder of Bombas Socks, and they literally had built a two, three hundred million dollar model um, in five years. You talk about the traditional hockey stick curve. I, I write these plans. I've given these plans. They barely go in that particular year. Down no, no, up, yeah, it never they get there. They have, and they're profitable. Uh, they're a great, a great business and a great mission. And um, you know how a company like that positions itself for a potential downturn is. You know, you've got uh, economies of scale. You're producing your production, so both on the you know the cost of goods side, you've got that supply chain managed well, and you can continue to improve efficiencies there. You've got a loyal base of followers. Uh, and then you can, uh, for them, you know, think about expanding into other product areas as well, beyond socks potentially. Um, so that way you don't have to worry about acquiring so many new customers as, as you can uh, extend the value to existing customers. And look, it's all cyclical. Uh, it's unlikely we're gonna be in a prolonged uh, recession. Um, you know, the downturns always result in upturns. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, in the mid early 19th century, when we had the Great Depression throughout the 1930s, you know, there were a lot of bad macroeconomic policies. Credit was, instead of loosened, it was tightened, and we now know better. So hopefully we won't have such a prolonged uh, period. Uh, even with the 2008 recession, that could have been a lot worse, but we did all the right things, I believe, as a country. 
uh, to to help get us out of that. And look, it's it's been happening straight. You know, as soon as we got into it, we did a number of things to help us get out of it. It took us some time, but we, we we've been doing it. Um, so anyway. Can you can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the strategies? I know you, you you're deal, also working with a big portfolio of companies at Love and just your experience on, on, yeah. on, on uh, you know some of, some of the strategies to maybe even build some sort of like redundancy into your business. For example, if you have vendors, do you want to have like a set of other vendors just in case whatever reason they can't make it through the tough times or redundancy on potential employees or anything like that to basically try to give you a little bit more. Uh, you know, more peace of mind, I guess, if, if things do go. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. No, I think that's a great, it's a, it's a great point. I think, um, the redundancy uh, the, having backup vendors, uh, it's always critical during a good or a bad time, but during a bad time, I think because of the market, things are aggravated and a lot worse and it's easier for your vendor to go out of business, provide subpar service, um, and a host of issues that are impact your quality and, and how you present yourself to your end consumer, whether it's <laughs> To, to, to do so and they may even work harder, at least uh, potentially that's the expectation. Uh, and then you still have freelance help. So I think you can test and learn with a lot of different resources much more easily. Um, I know we've tried to bring on people in the, in the last year uh, as a consultant or advisor uh, in a limited capacity. It's been tough. Uh, people want to have full time. They, there's a whole different uh, experience expectation that I think becomes a little easier. So that's the one thing that does, in my mind, become a little bit easier. Uh, there's less wage pressure. There's more people willing to dig in and commit to you, especially if they believe in your vision and align with your core value. Yeah, and Did I answer? I don't know if I gave a no, proper no, it, it makes perfect. But, it makes perfect sense. I mean, uh, we just sent out an email yesterday okay. with regards to, uh, you know, to the whole entire FI community, mentors, alumni, things like that, about just kind of how to think about this potential like coronavirus uh, up, uh, outbreak if there is going to be one. Um, and one of the things we said is like, look, in 2020, you should just have redundancy with regards to your supply chain, particularly if you're a hardware company. Um, you know, um, if you're working primarily with China for to, to build your product, you know, you probably want to think through like maybe somewhere other places in the world where you can have uh, be able to have yeah. similar outcomes just in case something were to happen. And either way, it's a good strategy, yeah. irrespective of the virus, irrespective of whatever. It, it, it is. Yeah, it, it is. But also, um, speaking from an early stage business perspective, it's very expensive to do that. So that's that's the biggest challenge is while in, in my, I know I should have five different vendors lined up, you know, with one of the other startups that we're working on, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to have many you know, vendors, call manufacturers set up because you need to get minimums. You know, I didn't add them for the one. So, but you still need to have them lined up just in case. Right. Uh, so I think your 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 situation is a little different for an early stage business. So my 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 suggestion is to really make sure that the person or, or entity you're going to be partnering with is prepared. And look, there's going to be exogenous risks. I don't think we could have predicted the coronavirus right here and now. Um, what we could be predicting is a, a downturn because it's been 12 years um, of some sort. Uh, so we can think through that. Um, I know we've had some challenges with China in the last two years uh, under the current administration. Some of that was brewing well before that in the previous administration. Uh, so I think naturally we want to just dig, you know, dig deep and look hard and try to find alternative sources. But as an early stage business, you're still a little limited. Uh, so it's good to identify them, but you may not be able to sign a contract or partner with multiple ones. Kudos to you if you can, but uh, not always going to be the case. Um, but with that being said, I, I, I do believe that uh, certainly with Founder Institute and even with Grow, I do think that there's such an incredible opportunity to even think, if you're thinking about starting a business, now is time to start evaluating that. Um, and then, you know, you have the added benefit of people leaving jobs or being, you know, um, fired. You know, there's a lot of um, shrinkage that goes on for companies that are poorly managed, that are cash flow constrained. So, you know, good folks are let go. So if you are thinking about uh, starting a business, 
maybe this is the catalyst that you need or you band together with other people who maybe share your vision and you start something together and you think about how you can test and learn that in a cheap way which again i think is a, is a great segue into both you know grow at a high level validating your idea and then going to founder institute to actually get the practical steps that you need to um actually you know plan fund and launch the business uh, in, a, in a meaningful way in a supportive community. Um, I've been a huge fan of Founder Institute and for years I think the model is the only one of its kind for such an early stage entrepreneur. But this is the way you test it and you see is entrepreneurship right for me? Is this model going to do well and you get the community to launch it? And so I'm a huge fan and I think uh, anybody should really who's got something in their head should really start to just just see if there's a there there. And if they think there is go to Founder Institute and, and then you know test it and um, you know there's not, you don't have to launch, but you're obviously encouraged to do so. You know, sometimes these conditions are really good forcing functions, whether it's to start your own or join something. Um, yeah. You know, um, so it's, it's, it could be a good thing if you look at it on the positive side. Well, we, we, right. we do. Well, and, and, and look, everything is cyclical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to, yeah, I guess just kind of give another second to kind of Put it to put it all in a wrap is to, yeah. let's put the scenario sort of in place. The downturn is here. You know, the, my startup. We're doing our kind of best to deal with it. Just to recap, you know, what are the, the kind of potential techniques that founders can put in place to improve their chances of survival? Of things yeah. you kind of talked about again. We're like looking at uh, outcomes, looking at your customer, and then looking at your values. Um, yeah, so anything else you kind of want to say about just in terms of founder planning uh, in, in conclusion? Well, you, you're right. You've got, the, you've got the three pieces. You've got create an outcome. Make sure that you're, you're, you're not selling a product. It's an outcome. And understand your customer so that you can create more value. It's really about creating more value. And it's more pronounced for your founder. And it will help you stand a better chance. And in terms of managing, you know, during a downturn, because, you know, capital could be tight, what can you do in terms of belt tightening? What can you do to secure a of credit beforehand? What can you do to foster those relationships with investors before you actually hit the downturn? because uh, it'll make it a little bit easier potentially uh, when you're actually in one. And then have a focus on, on, on actually creating a cash flow positive business. What are your business model economics? What are you doing to move to a path of profitability? Day one, we recognize most startups are not profitable. It may take a few years, but that's okay if you're hitting key metrics to get there. And I think attracting it always, the fundamental premise is always attract the talent and team to execute. I think that, that is, you know, evergreen. It's great. You need that at a certain point, but obviously during a downturn, I think that becomes even more pronounced. Um, we talked about the idea of, of making sure that your supply chain, uh, you've got a potential backup solution. So if something should go down, even in the case of a startup where you have the one provider, the one co manufacturer that they go out of business you have another one lined up so that maybe if you're not producing, you're not producing for one month, maybe two months at most. Puts a dent in your business, but doesn't necessarily have to put you out of business. Awesome. Well, this has How's been that for a, summary? Really, really, a great conversation with, I think, a lot of practical tips and really timely for, um, for people to start thinking about this now um, before a recession is really, really clearly upon us. Um, so thank you so much, Brian, for your well, time. We, we yeah, hugely appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And remember, be the change that you want to see in the world. I wish I said it, but it was Gandhi. So, uh, you're in this I, I too am a huge advocate of, of, of making sure we have a business with impact. So let's get going. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to let's.